Welcome to Shrimpers Cast with me, Paul Hill. And me, Steve Mansfield, on today's show. Blue Boys bounce back, taking four points from six on the road at Oxford and Maidenhead. It's New Boys to the rescue as Crover and Waldron secure Southend's first win in five games. I sit down with former Southend legend Mark Rule to talk all things shrimpers. And we preview two tough tests at home against Aldershot and Altrincham. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Shrimpers Cast. A little bit later in the week this week, uh, but we are here for you. I'm sat down with Paul Hill. How are you doing, Paul? All the better for seeing you, Squire. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. A little bit of the old lurgy. Um, <laughs> yeah, so not feeling 100%, but I'm I'm okay. I'm okay. Got the sniffles. Got the sniffles. Can't complain, can't complain. And South End fans won't be complaining, will they? What? a turnaround so last week we were in the doldrums looking at um you know the the bottom of the table the relegation zone and and it wasn't very positive uh but they went away uh two games this week oxford city maidenhead away uh drew the first nil nil and then got finally got that win first win in five games i think and uh yeah a couple of results and the mood um has been changed hasn't it yeah, just about. There's still, uh, you know, a, couple, a few people on social media still in the old uh, doldrums. Of course. But you're always going to get that. Yeah. But um, Oxford was always going to be a tricky one. Bottom of the league, fighting for their life. Their goalkeeper, mate, had a worldie. Pulled off loads of good saves and we dominated. We just couldn't find the uh, the back of the net for all the want of trying. Ralphie getting sent off as well didn't help. I mean, Not going to help, no. No, he went in with a bit of a meaty challenge, you know, of, you know, just putting his mark on the game, letting them know he's there. But yeah, do you see what he got sent off for? No, I didn't actually. No. But the ball was in, and he thought it's a second yellow, wasn't oh, it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, and he, he thought, you know, I'm going to do an overhead kick on near enough on a penalty spot, and uh, yeah, kick the guy in the head. Ball looks a bit instead of the, <laughs> getting the ball. <laughs> so he got uh, his second yellow there and got sent off. So we're going to miss him. Uh, hopefully, they might appeal it and uh, they might look back because you know he obviously wasn't going to kick the guy in the head. Mm. He was going for the ball, but um, and they might rescind it. But we, we never know. But yeah, if we, we, he is going to be a big miss. But yeah, it was just such a shame we couldn't get that um, result. But it's a clean sheet and everyone played well, I thought, you know, considering. Uh, and then on to Maidenhead. Wow, we could have smashed them. And we talk about the old boys coming back to bite us on the bum. And obviously Barrett got the assist, yeah. didn't he, for their equaliser. But uh, two new boys on the score sheet. Absolutely. Oh, I do like them. I think they're a great addition to our squad. And uh what a way to get off the mark away at Maidenhead because at one point when it went to 1-0 we did drop in that relegation zone mm. um, it's so tight down there have you seen so it? so tight the whole table's tight I know it's it? mad from like the foot to the top it's I mean, from obviously, 11th down yeah, to yeah. Um, the last couple of places yeah. it's a matter of points literally yeah. three or four points yeah. so anybody can be ready. no one is safe yeah. so you know it's that old thing in football isn't it forget what about's going on around you forget about the table forget about everyone else concentrate on what we can do yeah. to get them points and I'll tell you what if we were going to take like four points from these two games I would have bitten your hand off yeah I mean another good start foundation turning it around and uh, yeah well, long we, mate continue we like a little cliche don't we so it's, it's <laughs> the old stop the rot um, and, <laughs> and I think that's that's been done and now there's two home games which we'll be previewing later to kind of continue that that bounce back yeah um, we mentioned last week about you know, the results weren't great, but that there were a fair few new players trying to sort of get used to playing in the team. And you mm. made a point that, you know, players do need time. Um, they're stepping up, some of them, to, you know, to kind of play in uh, full time. There's going to be fitness issues there and it's going to need a, a little bit of, of bedding in time. And I think your prediction came true and, and we had both Crover yeah, and... Danny Waldron getting goals against Maidenhead to get the win. Morton with the assist as well from the corner. Yeah, exactly. All the three boys on on, on point. Exactly. So um, yeah, so that that uh, you know your crystal ball was was in full effect Polished. last week. Um, so we uh, neither of us actually made it to the to the game. Obviously, um, you know we Paul's been uh, staying on top of the highlights, but uh, we did catch up with. Uh, our man in the stand, Pip, a.k.a. Diversity, who did make it to both of the away games. So let's have a little listen to Pip's thoughts now. Legend. 
Pip, not one, but two away games for you to cover this week with the boys looking to bounce back after three straight losses and a worrying slide down that table. But first up, it was the basement boys, Oxford City. So how was it, mate? Good morning to you, Paul, and good morning to all you lovely, lovely listeners. My name is Diversity, and I am that nutter who happens to be a South and United vlogger who follows this team up and down the country recording it for a living. And boy, oh boy... It's not been a bad week, has it, folks? We've had an away point with a clean sheet, and then on Tuesday night to Maidenhead, a 2-1 win away again. It has all not been too bad, has it? Oxford, though, the 0-0 draw, I'm going to be honest, I think a lot of us were expecting more. Oxford, obviously, bottom of the table, conceding left, right, and centre. They conceded seven the previous week to Dagden Redbridge, and we could have put one past them. We had chances. The bar, their keeper, had a storm of game, but it just wasn't falling for us, and in the end, we had to settle for a point in what could have been a 3-0 victory. Yes, mate, their keeper definitely had a worldie and Ralphie had a bit of a stinker. He saw red off the two bookings, so how did that go down with the away f- support? Perhaps the most controversial thing of that Oxford City game was Nathan Ralph, the skipper, getting sent off after his two yellows. So let's just briefly cover it. The first yellow card in the first half, almost like a minute into the game, Ralph does a late tackle on their right winger and gets a deserved yellow. OK, fair enough. Second half, we enter that. Blues on top, causing problems for Oxford City down the left, right. And towards the end of the game, a cross comes in, I believe, from Wes von Gook. And Ralph goes up, he does a bicycle quick, of all things, he tries that, and just happens to catch the player with his boot as he's coming over to hit the ball. And if you look at it, he's been done harsh because he's not seen the player behind him. So you could say it's an undeserved red, but at the same time, he's made contact, so you have to give a card for it. And unfortunately, he sees red. And to be fair to Nathan Ralph, alongside all the other team, he's been amazing this season. So it was a big miss going into Tuesday night. Yeah, definitely. But getting our first point on the board in four games must have been some kind of mild satisfaction. Yeah, so we just said there the disappointment of Nathan Ralph getting sent off. But at full time, I sensed there was a lot of disappointment in the away end at Oxford City. Like I've said, they were bottom of the league. They conceded goals for fun and we couldn't put one past them. I think in that away end, we just felt disappointed. Like, why couldn't we score seven like Dagnum did? Why can't we just put like 20 past them that day? It just wasn't to be. But I suppose when you come away and you look at it, it's an away point. You need to be getting points from your away games just to stay in this league and even push up the table. So, and it's a clean sheet as well. Colin did well, the defensive well. When Colin was called into action, he made some great saves. So all in all, we have to respect Oxford City. They held in against us and, a point as a too bad actually well in our current position drawing your away games and trying to win the home games well there we go everyone loves that so on to Maidenhead and wow this one did look exciting and an early goal from our new boy Crowther talk us through it Exactly that, Paul. Adam Crowther on the score sheet early on. And after Saturday's mediocre, let's call it, performance versus Oxford City, Blues needed a big response against the Maidenhead side, who were placed in 14th prior to the start of the game. They are holding their own for a team that has always been near that relegation zone. They were probably further ahead than what they thought they'd be. So we know going into this game, Blues had to pull something out of the hat. And an early goal was exactly what was called for. And Adam Crowther rose like a salmon in the box, smashed the ball in, and ran straight to the away fans and joined in with the celebrations. It was a great sight to see a new boy scoring his first goal, coming straight to the fans and just having pure elation with the fans. It's great to see that the new boy's already settling in. Wow, and he's certainly shaping up to be a, a firm fan favourite. But cometh the hour, cometh the man. New striker Danny Waldron bagging the winner uh, for his first goal for the club. And uh, he deserved that, didn't he, Bip? We just said that Adam Crowther's first goal, a sight to see. But then Danny Waldron runs from one end of the pitch to the other and bags his first goal. A so cool, calm finish from the striker. That is the sort of thing, though, we've been told to expect from him. It's those nice calm finishes into the bottom corners he's better with his feet we've been told than his head but hey Danny if you want to prove us wrong please do but it was a great finish and again he's off the mark that's what we needed was goals versus Maidenhead we've been struggling to score goals and here we go two in one game from the two new boys that should hopefully set us up perfectly for games come up which are going to be tough Oldershot Altrigham Solial Oldham as well. They're all tight. They're all going to be busy and we need goals. And there was no better place to start than with the two new boys. 
Absolutely. It's going to be a, a bit of a challenge coming up, but one where we can't wait to see. But big thanks again, Pip. And uh, yep, we'll see you down the hall. Cheers, mate. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on again. And thank you to all of you for listening to me for the last couple of years. If you've made it through, thank you so much. And I will see you all on Saturday, or if not in the near future, for some more Blues content. Up the Blues! Big thanks there to Pip, a.k.a. Diversity. As we say every week, we give him a little plug. Check out his YouTube. He does a, a video blog, a vlog from every South End home and away game. Guy's an absolute nutter. Gets up and down the country. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's on YouTube and his handle is Diversity. But instead of an I, it's a one. So Diversity with a one at the start. Paul, you've been out and about. You've been busy again. And uh, you've you've ticked off another one of your your bucket your bucket <laughs> list items, meeting another one of your heroes. Who have you got for us today as your guest spot? Well, I was down at Roots Hall and uh, a bloke turned up on the pitch, someone I hadn't seen in a long time. And then I heard he was giving a bit of a uh, interview at the Far Post Bar with Andy Leader, our man at Super. So um, we, uh, me and Jude, the guy who wrote the theme tune quickly walked around there and uh, saw Mark Rule being interviewed. And I thought, he'd be great for the pod. I haven't seen Mark in ages, so waited for him to finish. Um, went up, shook Andy's hand. How you doing, Andy? If you're listening, good to uh, see you again. And said, Mark, fancy it, jumping on the pod. And uh, Andy linked us in, and um, here he is. It was great to talk to him about all things football, his, uh, his journey into uh, throughout the game, because he was quite prolific in the lower leagues and got his move to South End. And, uh, of course, he left, didn't he, for Oxford, so he got to talk about that, because I think uh, what goes behind closed doors at stadiums, we don't really get to hear do we? So it was great for, to hear his side of the story and uh, he didn't really want to leave. We didn't really want him to leave, but uh, it was great to sit down and chat with him. And uh, again, it was one of those ones we could have been talking all day, but uh, well, here he is, Mr. Mark Rawl. So I'm here today with another South End legend and played for us all the way back in 2001 and 2003. And it's only Mr. Mark Rawl. How are we doing, Mark? Good, mate. Thanks. Good, good, good. Good to be here. Well, thanks for coming on. It's um, I caught you um, doing the super chat up in the uh, is it the far post bar, and uh, and I, I kind of called you, didn't I? And said, "Oh, you're not coming to Shrimpers Cast. This would be great. Come and have a chat." <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it, was, it was good. It was really good to be back down at Root Ball and um, watching the match. And obviously, yeah, then you invite me on. I'm always up for this this kind of stuff. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's always great to see uh, our ex-players back down at the hall. And um, what was it like being back down there for all this time, being back on the pitch? Do you know what? It's it's because of obviously how I end up leaving. I never I've been back maybe two times before, one or two times before. I I'm never sure what kind of reception I'm going to get. Me personally, I've got like maximum love for the club, the time I spent there, the lads I was there, the supporters and things like that. And it was just. Um, and I've always had good things to say about it. It was just more my leaving. Obviously, we can get into that. And um, it just kind of left it on a, on a bit of a sour note, which which is never what I wanted or anything like that. But, you know, I was back there. And to be fair, everyone was good. It was good. It was good to good to see everyone again and um, some old faces that were still around or have returned back, you know, in terms of like um, John Gowans. Got to see him. I was like, very surprised. But um, no, it was good. Been back down there. I feel like back home again. That's what he's like. Mate, it was good to see you back there. Yeah, definitely. So let's start at the beginning because you kicked on at um, Rushton and Diamonds, wasn't it? Was that your first? That's where you kind of cut your teeth in football? Yeah. So I was obviously playing, I was playing local football in Leicester. Um, and a local, there was a scout who's kind of always used to be around us. And he had links with Leicester City. And I've been to um, Leicester City School of Excellence when I was, when I was a little bit younger. But for whatever reason, I just didn't get on there. So I played played like Sunday League and I played like um, midweek Floodlit League when I got a bit older, like 17. So between them times there, I'd kind of been to the Leicester City School of Essence. I just didn't get on with them. I couldn't, um, I just I just didn't feel comfortable there. I just felt because I wasn't around my friends, like who I played with week in, week out. And I didn't, I literally didn't get the professional, the more professional side of it. I couldn't get to terms with it at all. So I... I didn't go mm. well because I was in um, like Emil Heskey. He was in the year above me at the um, School of Excellence there. Wow! So like he he kicked on, and like I just didn't. So I ended up coming through the the other way, um, 
And then um, this same scout who was who got me into Leicester a couple of times, he goes, oh, well, Russian and Diamonds, knowing they were like, like non-league, big club in non-league football, sorted me out a trial over there. I went there and they said, yeah, come in for a bit longer. And I went there for a while. Then they offered me a contract. And uh, yeah, that's where I started. So I, was, I was still quite young. I was still quite young there. 70, I think I might have been 17, 18 years old then. And I, yeah, Rushed and Diamonds. I was there for maybe um, two years, I think I was there. Um, and it just got to the point, again, still at that stage, I hadn't really grasped what was needed. In my head, I was like, I'm playing football now and that's it. I didn't realise that he still had to kick on again. So I weren't really pushing myself. Um, I thought to myself, I'm young. There's older players who season pros, sort of thing. They're playing. I'll get my chance one day. But um, it was the same scout who, you remember, he pulled up to me. He goes, Why? One, one game I was on the bench for the first team. And he goes, Why are you not playing? And I was like, Well, you know, that these guys. He goes, No, I don't want to hear that. Why are you not playing? You should be playing. And I was like, and It didn't register in my brain. So I didn't really get on too well at Rushton. But I ended up moving on to, to Boston, got sold to Boston. Yeah, I got told to Boston there, which were, I think, the league below. So they were in the um, Vauxhall Conference at the time, which is National League now. Um, and I went down to Boston, who were in the Doc Martins Prem at the time, which would be the Conference North or some, whatever it's called now, Blue Square North, it would have been then. Um, Blue Square South, I think it might have been. Yeah, Boston, I went there then. And that's where it was, and I kicked on from there, yeah. I going to say, kicking on, you were quite, you know, well, you found the back of the net quite a few times down there for Boston, didn't you? So, was it 32 goals in 53 games for them? It was something like, and again, do you know when, you, when you're when you young, you just, I'm just playing football, like, I'm just enjoying myself, and I'm just scoring goals, I glad enjoyed playing, I built some good relationships there. Um, it was my second season there where, because I think I joined there maybe in like January of, of uh, I can't remember what you think, it was 99, January 99. Um, and then played the first season, scored a few goals there, not too much. But then it was the second season where I really kicked on and we won the league. And I scored a top scorer then. Um, there was myself and um, a few of that other older ones. But there was a young lad, um, David Norris, who then kicked on. He left. He actually got sold before I did um, from Boston. He got sold to Bolton Wanderers. And then he's kicked on, had a really, really good career, played Ipswich and um, Plymouth and, you know, all them, them ones there. He's had a really good one. But me and him had a quite a good partnership. He was a couple of years younger than me. But we'd be, between me and him, we were scoring goals, like smashing it. And then um, we won the league that year, uh, got promoted to the um, conference, uh, like I say, National League. And we kicked on that season as well. But that second, that, that third season, if you like, for me, I, the manager didn't really want to play me because what, what it was, it was I finished top scorer, which I, I was still young, but he decided to bring in senior players from like, he bought players in from Russian and Diamonds, older ones than me. Because in his head, from this, well, this is only from my perspective at the end of the day, you know what I mean? But he brought in these other guys who I, he believed would do the business at that higher level. He kind of struggled a bit. I was on the bench. I'd come off the bench, I'd score. And then I'd, you know, then I'd eventually got me to he let me play. And I, I was up top with um, Ken Charlery, um, legend, absolute legend, Ken. <laughs> he's, he's got, I remember we used to watch him on TV, um, playing for the lots of like Notts County, Peterborough, not Notts County, sorry, Peterborough, and, and other, other clubs around low in the championship and league one sort of thing. But yeah, he was an absolute legend and I learned a lot off of him, you know, in terms of how to play and things like that. So, and I had a quite a good season that, that final season. I ended up scoring, um, I think I finished that seat that before I got sold to South End. I think I got, I scored about 15. I can't remember something like that. That's mainly from what I was from on the bench, not many, many starts. And then um, I actually, I bumped into, um, oh, what's the Ian? Ian, is it Benjamin? Is it Ian Benjamin, former striker. At South. Yes, Ian Ben. Yes. Yeah. So I bumped into him when I, a few years ago when I played a charity game at South End, and he was there. And I actually got speaking to. Him. He told me, which I didn't know at the time. He told me that he that Webby um, Gaffer sent sent him to come and watch me when I was at Boston, and I'd played my. Wow. I played a game. He, 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 I think he watched a couple of games or or Webby had been watching me for a couple of games 
um, or sending people. But he sent him down to watch me away at the Oval, which turned out to be one of my final games for, for Boston. So he'd watched the game. And when I tell you, this is crazy how, how it happened. I was, I'll, I'll try and go through it as quickly as possible, but it's a mad story how it went. That's right. Take your time. Go for it. Okay. So at Boston, I had um, a bit of a falling out with, with Steve Evans, the manager, right? So basically, he, he, he'd owed me uh, my sign on fee, some money, yeah? And I was meant to get my, my final instalment of my sign on fee, which was about £1,500, two grand or something like that I was owed. But for about two months, he was saying to me every single week, Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday. I kept going to him, where's my money? Have you got my money? You got my money? You must be paying me. He's like, I'll pay you on Tuesday. Pay you Thursday. Pay you Saturday. Pay you, pay you, pay you. All the time, kept putting it off. So I'm thinking, he's, he's, he's stitching me up here. He's not going to pay me um, what he's owed. And then, obviously, there was some interest coming in from, from South End. And I'm thinking, this guy's going to try and sell me, get rid of me, and then not pay me what it was, what he owes me. Um, wow. Like, okay. And then... Again, spoke to the legend Ken Charlie. He said, Rory, you're doing bits for the team and that. What you need to do is tell him, if you don't pay my money, don't play me. I'm not playing. Like, well, everyone. So I'd messaged Evans on, like, um, I messaged him on, like, say, the Thursday night or some Thursday or Friday. I said, listen, this has been going on for, like, nearly two months now. You keep fobbing me off. You owe me some money. You know you're supposed to be paying me. Um, if you don't, pay my money on Saturday or by Saturday, don't don't put me in the team. So then he's got, he didn't reply to my, my text message. So I've gone and met the coach. Remember, we've travelled from Boston, picked me up from near Leicester, and we've drove south to Yeovil. I've got on the coach, the guy's blanked me all the way down, got off on the service station, got back on the coach, he's blanked me all the way down, got to Yeovil, I walked out. Joe, when you do the, the pre walkout on the pitch where you get the match programs, you arrive at the ground. I walked out on the pitch. I'm like looking and I'm fuming now. And I'm like, this guy's, you know, taking a, taking a bit. So I've like gone, I'm on the pitch and I've gone to walk off. I saw him walk onto the pitch. So I've walked up to him and I've gone, what's going on? Like, what's happening? And he goes, oh, he goes, oh, so you're not playing then? No. And I goes, no, I'm not playing. You, you got my money? He goes, no. I goes, I'm not playing then. Forget it. And he goes, nah, nah, Rory, just play. And I was like, he goes, I'll get you later. I goes, nah, I'm not, don't put me in. I goes, I'm going into the change room, getting my bag and I'm going, sort of thing. I'm going, I'll sit in the stands. He's chasing me, going, no, no, wait a second, wait a second, Rory. Um, I got to see the chairman. I goes, come on, let's go and see him now then, me and you, let's go. He goes, no, no, just, just a second, I'll, I'll, I'll sort it. He goes, I promise you, because I was dead adamant I weren't playing. I goes, I, I'm not playing. And he goes, look, Rory, just get your kit on. Do the warm up and I'll sort it for you. I promise you. I goes all right. So I've gone out and done the warm up, fuming by this time, and I've come back in, and there's a check hanging out my back pocket and my my thing. So I've saw the check with my right amount. I've gone right. Well, I'll play. So I wasn't going to play this game at that point. So then I've gone out, gone and played the game. I think we lost like two one, but I've had a good game. I scored, um, and then I've, that was it. When I spoke to um, Ian at this charity match, he said he came to watch me at Yeovil. Webby sent me to watch, him, watch me at Yeovil. And I'm like, I wasn't going to play the game if he hadn't paid me the money. So you wouldn't have seen me play. You know, and that could have really, like, you know, like a sliding doors moment. Like, I probably wouldn't have played. You wouldn't have seen me. Webby's like, I've played, I've scored. Webby's gone to him and said, um, I think Webby, I mean the gaffer. <laughs> the legend, the gaffer, by the way. Um, so <laughs> he said to him, like, what do you reckon? Uh, and he said, yeah, he's a bit raw, but I'd take a chance on him. Is he worth a gamble? Yeah, worth a gamble. Go for him then. So then that was it. Then the deal, he's put the bid in and I've ended up at, um, at South End. And um, yeah, so that was that. Wow. Could never have happened had it not been for that check. Blimey. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Mad, absolutely bonkers. But yeah, it doesn't surprise me, Steve Evans. He, he seems that kind of a character, doesn't he? He's been that way all the way through football, you see. He's a bit of a, could be a bit of a, a strange one to deal with. Yeah, so many stories about him. But, you know, do you know what? I, what I'll say about him, right, is he's an absolute nightmare. But I've, I've got a lot of love for him in the sense of the, the opportunities he gave me in terms of playing me. 
And he set his team up in the right way. He gave me a, a good platform. I took it. Um, he did what he's got to do behind the scenes and whatever, rightly or wrongly or whatever. And he's annoyed a lot of people, but his team won the league. He won another league, got a promotion. And he's, he's just got, he's been really successful moving on around the place, whatever. So people can say what they want about him and have lots of stories about him. But, you know, I'm, after I see him, I say, yeah, I feel thank you and whatever, you know. You're annoying and <laughs> you annoyed me. But yeah. like, <laughs> My experience with him really set me up for the game because, you know, I saw he's painted a picture of what it would be like, you know, characters I'd come up, come up against or have to deal with sort of things. So, you know, and I've, and I've seen some characters in the, through the game. I definitely have. Marvellous. Well, it, well, then it got you the move into South End by the governor, the gaffer, Mr David Webb. So, um, I mean, it, it, I was a bit too young for uh, when he took South End uh, screaming up through the leagues back uh, in the early 90s. And, uh, but, I mean, what was he like to play for as a coach, as a manager? He's very, he's very no-nonsense. Very no-nonsense. He basically told you what he wanted and what he expected and, and he told you to do it and you basically did it or you weren't playing. Um um, but at the same time, it was took throat in, in one sense, but he'd pull you to the side and go, you know, don't do this, do more of this. And he was and he took time with me. So he gave me advice on on how to kind of play. Because there were certain things I, I was I was quite raw. I didn't I didn't do the conventional like through the professional youth team system and going up and then promoted through. I didn't do all of that. I didn't do any youth teams like that. I just played, I played Sunday League football. Then I went into Rushton, you know, professional contract. So I missed that early, basic, nurturing, you know, basics and that. So I was kind of very, for a lot of them, I was very off the cuff. Um, my first touch wasn't the best. I had to really, really work on that. But that's stuff you would have picked up for a youth team then basics I kind of skipped over that but because I skipped over it and was doing well I, I was scoring goals I was a nuisance I was quick I was you know I would try things I would do a trick here or there I would shoot from you know outside about bending the top bin I would score bicycle kicks I'd score scissor kicks I'd do all that and I was successful on that side of things so it kind of overlooked like, some of the some of the basics but then when you get to that professional level those basics really really are uh, necessary and that puts, it puts you apart from, from certain other people so he did spend time with me and you know gave me some advice told me to like you know calm down a little bit and take on and I'd be and again when you go up to the higher level you go up you can't just run the pitch you get caught offside so he, he was taught he spoke to me a little bit about holding my runs a lot more and bending them and whatever so yeah, I got, uh, he, and again, it was he, the way he's, he's spoken to, uh, and the way he put it across to me was like, look, son, here you go. This is what you should do. This is what you need to go and do. And um, you can either listen to me, take on the advice, and or not. And what I really did like, and I take it on myself in terms of coaching, when I saw, when he saw I was actually trying to do the things that he spoke to me about, he'd say, well done. I can see you're trying it, and I've got time for that. So good, good. That's that's a good thing. Um, you still need to work on it, but at least you're trying. You're not ignored me, and you've whatever. So I remember, and and you kind of went in, and if Webby's if the gaffer's praising you about something, whatever it is, you kind of were, kind of chest went up a little bit. Your confidence kind of grew because you kind of wanted to, you wanted to uh, impress him in that way. So you and and. He, he signed, of, I think when he came back in, obviously when he, Tommy remember who was manager before him, when I was when I, when I, when that second or third stint when he was there. But he started signing a lot of young players at that time. So you had the old, old school ones. And I think he was trying to shift some of the older ones out and then bring the new, new lot in. So there was likes of, um, I think, Tess Bramble. And there was Shane Wardley, who was there before, I'd, before I got there. Then I came in. He was bringing um, Dave McSweeney through. Um, Leon Hunter, Leon Johnson. Um, he's bringing those lads all through. Mm -hmm. Then just after me, he's got Leon Court. Um, 
which is a, a good mate of mine. And um, yeah, that, me and Corty. Um, with, the thing with me and Corty, I'll tell you this. When I was at Boston, I was at Boston and Corty was, I think he was at Millwall. But Corty had gone on loan to Forest Green for a period of time. And I ended up playing against Corty when he was at Forest Green. Didn't know who he was and that. And then we played the game. And I swear, even to this day, he was my hardest opponent i come across, right? We, he, kicked, he kicked lumps out of me. I kicked lumps out of him. And I was... What, what, what was really testing was I was obviously quick. But and I'd, all through my years when I was at Boston, I'd get on the shoulder of someone, in them, and I'd just take off and I'd leave them in the dust. I'm doing the same thing to Courtney. And then he's had this long leg just come and just scoot the ball away from me, take... And I'd, be, and I'd never had that, and it was just an absolute battle. So I really had to think about how to, how to, how I can get around him. I could, he really got me thinking more than I'd ever had done at that time. So it was a real, real battle in that game, and he stuck in my brain. I remember coming home, speaking to my brother, saying, "I'm sure I played against that um, Carl Court's brother. I'm sure that was him. He was in centre half, and that he was, that he was quite good, and you know, hot to." And then my second season, I think it was that like pre-season, he's. He's coming sat in the change room next to me, and we looked at each other and went, Hey, he goes, Yo, you're right. He goes, and we were both like, And I said to him, He was my top spoke, and he said to me, like, Oh, you were, you were, you were solid. I couldn't, like, we both had this mutual respect. And he was saying his hardest time while I see the playing for his green was coming against me and Ken Charlery at top. Uh, we were just all over the place, and we were absolute havoc. He was spinning in behind, or you know, and for me, I didn't realize that we was. Obviously, I knew we did well together, but I didn't realise what kind of habit we was causing and how good we played together when when you hear it back. But that's what we had this mutual respect for each other from then. And and since from the time we walked in the door, it was like, yeah, we got like, we, were, we was boys, you know what I mean, from then. Um, and yeah, it was that one. I always knew what he'd do at the back. He's, with, with the team itself, we kind of all got to know each other and we got really quite quite close. And I think, with there's maybe three clubs where I've been at and we've, we've had good times where I maybe I think as a unit we kind of came together we weren't obviously too successful as a team as a South End but what we did achieve with the young players that we had in the team and you know the camaraderie that we kind of had together I think it was quite it was really special because I I'm still close with I'm, I'm still close with Pess I will still speak to Courtney now, now and again checking on him and even if the ones who I don't have, Jay Smith as well, a good lad, good good mate as well. Um, the other lads who I probably don't speak to as much, if I do come across them somewhere around the circuit, back at South End or wherever, it's love. You know what I mean? I saw bumped, I might bump into Kev Kev Mayer at the um, mm. at the game the other day. Then I, I, I told him, yeah. I told him when Tony straight to his face, I goes, I didn't. I, I said to him, Kev, I um. It wasn't until I left South End that I appreciated how good you were when when I was there because the things that you were doing in the middle of the park, bringing balls down, holding people off, and just playing simple or clipping over the top for runs, I've kind of gone away expecting that's just normal. But then I'm seeing that there's a lot of players who can't do what you were doing, and I'm like, just just clip it over the top and running. And I'm like, well, fuck it. Only Kev, only Kev can do it. <laughs> Same thing only Kev can do this kind of stuff. All dropping out of the air and he's holding people up and winning it and turning and passing out, simple, keeping control. I'm like, Kev's doing this. And it, and I said, I didn't appreciate it until I actually left. And I go, you're like, your ledge. Uh, so, you know, that's that's kind of what it was. Good good, good bunch of lads. Good bunch of lads at South End. Oh, definitely, yeah. Absolutely. But the, um, I mean, Webby wasn't there that long because he had to step down, didn't he, because of um, a health scare. And then, was it Rob Newman came in and and uh, was in an interim kind of... Yeah, Rob, Rob and uh, David Crown came in and, and, and took us. Uh, that was interesting as well. I mean, that's, that was the one because when I signed and we were there, Rob was a, was a player. Yeah. So... Then all of a sudden, like within the space of the day, he walks in the following day and was like, Yeah, everyone called me Gaffer. And I was like, Everyone's like, What? Yeah. <laughs> you, you were just you were winning Bantam in the change room yesterday. You, you mean Gaffer? And it was it was it was a weird transition. Um yeah, it was a strange thing. But 
we kind of obviously after you know a week or two we got said let's just get on with it and we just you know did what we could do yeah. we tried I just don't I just, and it you know it was, it was one of them ones that he, he had um, brought some of his training sessions he brought down um, but we brought Rule Fox mm. down because obviously had his Nor- Norwich City connections or whatever so Rule come down and did a bit of um, forward coaching and things like that it was fun it was good it was good it was um he, he was all right. He was a good lad as well. Um, uh, and yeah, it was just, it was a good period of time. We just kind of got on with it, knuckled down as best we could. Um, and again, we, 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 we turned into really, really good performances and then other performances weren't the best, weren't, weren't as good. I remember we, there's certain teams we really struggled against, like, lots of like Hartlepool. Um, I don't think we beat Hartlepool. Well, we beat once, we beat them in the cup. One one time in the FA Cup, but I think most of the time we either got a draw or we lost to Hartlepool. Um, it's just one of them teams that we just couldn't, you know, for whatever reason, just couldn't get the better of. And um, there were just teams like that to stick out in my brain that we had some either good good encounters against. I remember we had the, there was a Luton Town, um, Luton Town grudge sort of thing, but also Cambridge United as well. We had some really good games. I really like the yes. two clubs there in my South End days were the two clubs I really enjoyed playing against because it was a challenge. Obviously, Newton kicked on and got motion in that season. Um, no, I think 2022, 20, I think it was. They got motion anyway. I think they finished second behind Plymouth, I think, or something like that. Um, but they were a really good team and we had good battles against them. Um, and well, like I say Cambridge United as well. They were a really tough mm-hmm. team, and they were they had young players. Um, who was at top for them? Um, oh, what's his name? The tall ginger guy. He played for. Um, he went on played for Stoke. He played for Stoke. Yeah, he played. Went on played for Stoke. John. No, it weren't John Stead because he was at Huddersfield. Um, it was. Um, oh, what was he? <laughs> I can't remember. He was a good player. He was a good. He was really, really tall. Had a really good touch. Oh, um, um, which you wouldn't expect for someone so tall. And I can't remember what his name is, but he was really. He had some good lads in that team. Really good lads. There's Omar Rizzo, who was ex West Ham. Shane Tudor, good, good. Play, Tom Young, um, Stev, Stev, Ang, uh, Stev Angus. Yeah. All like really, really good players that we were, that, and we had some good battles against them. Really good fun, good fun. Yeah, I went away to the Cambridge away, and, we, and that was a yeah, it was a, that always stuck out in my mind. As a, it was an absolute humdinger. Well, there was quite a few because I tell my kids when they say they look at Luton and Swansea, I was like, and they were like, oh, they're all up there. And I was like, we well, we used to beat them, you know, <laughs> down at Roots. Or I remember a, a great game at Swansea. I think we were one 0 down, and we ended up winning four two. Um, that was a great game, and um, there's been a few like that in, in that um, two thousand and was it two thousand and one. 2002 season maybe it might be that one that was some really good games in that um, in that season a big one well against your old club Rushton as well wasn't it I think that was was that 4-1 4-2 can't remember the, the Rushton one okay. we, we, we um, I mean there's one one of the games I hope one of the home games we had against Rushton we beat them 2-1 we beat them 2-1 well, I was saying 2-1 um, we, beat, we beat them but it was a I would say it was a, a significant game for me because it was my former club, um, and pretty much the manager uh, Brian Tolbert, who'd signed me at Rushton, sort of thing. But he, when he when he sold me, he said, "What was his words?" He said something like, "He told Steve Evans when he sold me, he goes, yeah, you can have him. He'll, he's never going to make it in the league. He never played in the league, sort of thing. He's not he's not good enough." And but then I, he told me that. Uh, that the thing is, this is what Evans told me. I don't know if. Tolbert actually said that, but I was fired up for years waiting for this opportunity to play against him again. I think he probably did because he pretty much said similar stuff to my face as well in front of people. Quite embarrassing sometimes. But but then when I, we played there, I think after a few minutes I'd score, I scored the first goal and I was buzzing about that. And then I think they... He, no, we then Sterling scored. Damon Sarr scored a fantastic volley from outside the box. I beat the keeper, dipping Oh, the Yes. And then, and then they scored, made it two one. But we held out and we beat them two one. But that game was just so significant 
for me, and it just kind of kicked on because it was like I'd, you know, I'd kind of like two fingers up to him in that respect. You know what I mean? I was in the league playing against his team who just got promoted. So I and I, it just kind of I'd made it back. I made it into the league before Rushton made it into the league as well. And then I'd played against them, we beat them. Obviously, Rushton kicked on after that and had a good spell, got promotions away. But it was just that one for me and playing against some of the old my old teammates as well. Um, return leg. I mean, we lost again against. I think it might be the following season. We lost at their place, um, but you know, just that one. It was really, really significant for me. Yeah, good time. Yeah, there's been some absolute cracking games, isn't there? I mean, in, apart from that one, then in the in during your time at Southend, what, what would be what game really stuck out for you? I would say stuck out for me. Um, I would say the Luton Town FA Cup game, home game. Um, we beat them. I think we beat them three one, three two, three two, three two. That was because I got one and Tess got yeah. two in that one. And do you know? Do you know what? I remember playing that game. Do you know who? Um, what's his name? Lee Taylor, left back. Um, Stuart? No, it's Taylor. That was a, his name was Taylor. Anyway, I can't remember his first name, but he left Luton eventually. Kicked on to Portsmouth and. Played, had a really good Premier at West Ham. He was at West Ham as well for a bit. Had a really good career afterwards. But I remember playing that game and I watched the videos back from that game. He was unreal. Like he didn't, I think he gave the ball away once. Literally clipping balls on the channel, passing balls inside, delivering crosses. He gave the ball away once in that whole game. And I was like, mate, what a player. <laughs> then he kicked on and had a good career. But that game there, the, the home one, I'd... Um, we had a bit of tension between us because I think we played them in the league at home. I can't remember if we won that one or whatever, but then we played them at their place and it was a... I got sent off in that game and it was for something I didn't even do. I was fuming about it. Still irks me to this day. Um, got straight. Um, I tri- I, basically, I, I, I'd gone on a run, gone past a couple of players and I was pushing on down through the midfield and a guy just came out and just took me out from behind. And I've like gone on the floor. Is that really took my ankle? And I've gone down and rolled. And in my brain, I was thinking, oh, it's a free kick. The guy's going to get booked for that because he's cleaned me out. And I've rolled and I've like got up on my knees and I saw the game still going on. I've gone to the ref. I'm like, ref, like, what's going on? And he goes, no, 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 play on. You, you, like, you, you dived or something like that. So I've gone like, I've gone off. Like, I've gone on the floor, gone, fucking hell. Like, one of them ones just lay on the floor. As I went out on the floor, my hands over my face, the guy, some one of their players, ran tripped over my leg. Just tripped over my leg. Referees kind of saw it out of the corner of his eye, and he assumed I'd kicked out of this guy. I'd not even seen him. I've gone like, just gone, you know, like, hands over my face, and just got rolled on the floor, like, say, like, in frustration that I'd not got the free kick. And some guys tripped over my leg. Didn't even see him. I've looked up and go, what was that sort of thing? Referees come over card straight out red card you kicked him you've kicked him and I'm like oh. I didn't I didn't watch the videos this is long before bar was on <laughs> was on no bar no. <laughs> so, yeah, I got off, but I was very annoyed about that but what was even more annoying is the fact that when I've got in the changing room because this is where where Webby had just he was he was still manager but he was he, that's when he just was sick and Rob had taken the game, like, in the interim period, just until he was confirmed. So we'd taken that game. So I've gone back in the change room afterwards. And obviously, in my opinion, I'd been wrongly sent off. I hadn't done anything wrong. So I kind of was there. Rob's pulled me up, like, in front of the lads at the end of the game and saying, oh, you've let the team down, this, this and this. And I'm like, I didn't do anything. I genuinely didn't. Like, so then what he's done is he's obviously, Webby's shouted at him and said, what's going on? He's gone and fed back to Webby that like, Rawley's really gone and kicked a lad, got himself sent off, really put us into the cash and whatever. So Webby's obviously said, get him in tomorrow, run him, run him tomorrow. So I've had to go back in, train on Sunday, do extra running and whatever. Monday, I got called into the office and then Rob sat there going, so basically what you got to say for yourself. One of them ones really had me up. And I was like, I was really annoyed about it because... That because that wasn't what had happened. I didn't genuinely. Did. I goes look, watch the video back. You'll see I've gone down. But on the video, it's just panned just at the wrong time, so you couldn't really see it. So 
It was a bit, oh. a bit frustrating. So you've got the gaffer is away. He was ill, didn't see anything. Just having this report from Rob and I'm pleading my innocence and everything. So it was a bit of a, so me and Rob had a little bit, like I wasn't, we had that little bit of, you know, irkiness about it from that. But that was kind of spilled over until we got to the FA Cup game. So I'm like, right, I'm on it now because of this, this and this. So, <laughs> so yeah, then we ended, like I said, we I scored and won the game and it was, um, that was a good one. But so that one sticks out in my mind. But also, we had a home game against uh, Cambridge as well. And I think that might have been like a 3-2 kind of thing as well. It was um, it was a tight game, S- similar situation. They scored, we scored, they scored two, then we came back one three two, 3-2, something like that. It was a, like I say, a real ding-dong kind of affair. But yeah, they're a couple of games for me. Nice, brilliant stuff. But then, well, Rob left, didn't he? And then you had um, Steve Wignall came in. And uh, things really kind of changed a bit there when Steve moved in because uh, then you moved out, didn't you? To um, and it, it's well documented where you end, you end up going to um, signing for Oxford, but uh, you didn't really want to leave, did you? No, absolutely not, absolutely not. It was it was it was strange because I finished the season top goal scorer. I'd done really well that season. Obviously, uh, Wignall's come in for the last few games of the season, and I and I remember it was like. Maybe the last the last home game we, we had, I scored two at I scored two at Tor- against Torquay. Um, had a really good game as well. So then you get to the end of the season, contracts are up for certain players. I was one of them, and this is where you get called in. Literally, you, you sat at the training ground. You're getting called in by the manager to go and have these talks about what they're looking to do next year with you. So I'm at the training ground thinking, right, I've finished top goal scorer. Um, yeah, he's gonna. I've, I've, because, yeah, bear in mind when I first signed, Webby stuck me on a, I think a two and a half year deal. Yeah, so I've signed two and a half years, so I signed in January, so it was the end of that season, then two years after that. When, um, when he signed like Tess, he signed Tess only on a one and a half year, so the end of that season, one more season, right? So obviously, Tess's contract ended before. At the end of the first season, our second season, I think it was, my second season, his second season, Tess finished top scorer, right? Cool. Tess got a new deal. And I think his deal was like maybe double my deal. But they didn't want to move on my thing until the end of my contract. So I'm like, right, okay, he's finished top scorer. He's got a better deal. Cool, I'll ride it out. I'll be, you know, whatever. I've proved I can do, do it at this level. I've top scored and whatever. Here we go. Contract negotiators, or he's what he's going to offer me. I've walked in the door, and he's gone right, Rory. What we're going to do is we're going to, um, I'm going to give you another year. I'm going to keep you on the same, exactly the same money that you were on from the season before. And I've said, wait, I was already on that. I've just finished top scorer. Surely, you know, in line with what everybody else, anyone else who's finished top scorer get, has got an increase. Even you know, I'm not asking even for to double it or nothing. I'm not asking. Realistically, I would have would have taken like an extra hundred, like an extra hundred quid a month, no, a, a week, sorry, on top of what it was, which was still way below like the top earners at the club or whatever it was. It was like hundred quid. Um, so I said, um, I was like, what? That? I'm not really sure why that's the case. So then he said, um, he's got no, that's why I'm offering you. And I goes, all right, I'm gonna have to think about this, you know. At that stage, when I say I think about it, no other clubs were coming in for me. There were no other interests anywhere else. I, I didn't want to go anywhere. So I spoke to him again, uh, tried to speak to him. And he was like, no, don't want to speak to you. Take it or leave it sort of thing. Then my agents tried to call him. Um, I spoke to Stuart. I think Stuart Robson was there at the time as well. As, as an assist. I spoke to him and he goes, no, it's a bit, it's, it's a bit harsh that is, Rory, but I'll have a word with him. So he had a word. My agent tried to have a word with him. He was like, no, 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 that's it. Gave me a deadline, said you gotta let me know in like you've got two weeks to let me know. So in that time, so this is what was crazy. In that time, I've had to go and do like a um uh as part of my duties as a South End player, I had to go and do like a school visit, so like a player appearance somewhere, somewhere in South End. So I went to a school, like it was a, a fate or something like that. So I've gone in as doing appearance, me and one of the like. And it just so happened that um Ron Martin, I think his his younger, his grandchild or his kid went to this school. So I've gone in there 
he seen me and said, he come up to me, he's like, oh, Rory, like, how you doing, Mark? And this, that, shook hands and we spoke. He goes, I understand there's a bit of an issue with the contract. What's what's happening? What's the, what's the, what's the hold up? And I said, well, I explained to him, look, this is what it was. And because I'm not even asking for more, like much more, just like 100 quid. He goes, is that it? And I goes, yeah, like, not, not, not from, he goes, all right, leave it with me. I'll go and have a word. So it must have been like a day or two later, the phone rings. Mr. Wignall on the phone. He's gone, how dare you go try and go over my head. I've told you what it is. He's effing and blind on the phone to me. I've told you what the deal is. Don't you ever try to go over my head again. Look, I didn't take this deal away from you. This, this, and this. It is what it is. You've got until Wednesday to make up your mind. That's the deal. Don't you ever go over my head again. Human. Like, scream down the phone. I'm going, listen, that wasn't, I'm not trying to explain what I just said to you. That's what it was. But then, Basically, I've got, I had a bit of interest. I think um, Lincoln City shouted me. Weren't so, I think, um, who was the other one? Um, Ch- Chester City. Mark Wright was at Chester City. They shouted me. And I was like, not really feeling it. I'm just, what you're offering me isn't worth it. Leave me leaving South End. I'm able to stay where I am. Literally, on the day, the Wednesday, when I was due to go in, say I was supposed to be in the club to go and sign the contract at like 11 o'clock. It must have been like half nine in the morning. My agent phones me and goes, Oxford want you. And they're offering you this. Like, they offered me pretty much what I was asking for at South End. But I'd, that season, I played home and away against Oxford. I scored scored home and away against them. Really impressed with their stadium. The setup was really good. Like, it was a nice setup sort of thing. And the manager was saying, I'm going to play this, this, this. Oh, yeah, bear in mind. During the time when Mr. Wigner was speaking to me, he told me I'm going to keep you on the same money. And on top of that, we're going to sign Drew Broughton. And I see him, I only see him really playing. So you'd be only basically back up to him. I'm like, wait. He goes, I was like, what are you? So you're not going to play me and you're going to keep me on the same money. So that's the two things he kind of said. Pretty much to your, like, well, you're off to the side. So then I've said, so I've weighed it up. At that point, I said, well, and the major was like, look, we've got to get there now. So I've gone, all right, cool. So I just obviously drove to Oxford, spoke to them, and then they said, I just decided to go and sign. I walked around the stadium, it was really nice, and set up, and he was promising this, this, and this, and he was like, yeah, did. So I was like, may as well sign, because they've stitched me up over here. And then, so I ended up signing there, and that's how it kind of went. But obviously, it gets fed back. So Mr. Wignall's now got on the TV or radio and started giving it how <laughs> I don't even know exactly what he'd gone and said, but he obviously wasn't good and he'd give it the gold digging, um, money hungry kind of, you know, mercenary kind of talk. Uh, Mark Raw, this, this, and this. So obviously, like I was getting pelters from everyone. I was getting people some supporters, I don't know who it was, but phoning me somehow I got hold of my phone number, was phoning me up, threatening me down the phone. Um, my car was getting egged because oh, I was still in South End for a period before I had to go and move so my car was getting egged outside my house I was getting all sorts of that then obviously I've gone and made the move and then I've had to come, come back and play against South End for Oxford and I was getting booed the whole stadium <laughs> apart from Oxford. Oxford everyone's booing me every time I'm warming up down the side of the pitch and all sorts so it wasn't a good situation it weren't good and it was, it's sad, saddening for me because, I, like I said, I've still got a lot of love for the club and everything like that, but it was sad how it kind of played. Like I said, none of, all the boys knew that I played with. Everyone knew what I'd got on. So they knew what it was. And they'd back me. They were like, well, mm. you had to do what you had to do. And, you know, no hard feelings anywhere with, my, with the boys. We still speak, you know what I mean? So, yeah, a bit sad. But that's the thing, we, we, we don't get to hear these things, do we, that happens in the, the manager's office and closed doors. You know, we don't get to hear these things. And, well, you shut up all the boo boys because you ended up coming back and scoring for Oxford, didn't you, at the hall? And I was there at that match as well, and I was like, yeah, there we go. It always happens. But ex-players come back and score. But, uh, but yeah, I didn't want to see you leave. That, that was a right shame seeing you go. Uh, it's an unfortunate, unfortunate. Because, you know, you know we, me, myself, especially me and Tess, I felt we had a really good understanding and and um, we and we were tests yeah. we, we kind of really I'm not saying telepathy or anything like that, but I kind of knew what he was doing, he knew what I was going to do. And uh, do you know what? Even down to 
again, we played this this charity game later on, like only a few years ago. We're both obviously long time retired, um, both unfit sort of thing and whatever. Now we're playing against this 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 um, team, but even just being on the pitch with him, he I was I got the ball, I turned, and he's exactly where he was when we were playing in the same place. I played him through. I think he'd gone and scored. And we just had that understanding. He knew to flick it this way. We just knew what we were doing. And it just kind of just went. And he just, we just knew. So it was, it was good. We had a really good understanding with things. So it was a shame we couldn't kick on. Obviously, I, I remember even when we played, because I mean, at the time when we beat, beat them at, at the at, at hall, it was, um, they were having a bit of a hard time down the bottom of the end of the table. And I kind of, finished the game we beat them but I was like look guys come and sort yourselves out like they hopefully stay up sort of thing and um, obviously they did but then obviously then I think Tilly took over eventually didn't he um, and then you've kicked on and really yes. well I'm I'm sitting there watching I'm, I remember I was away I think, I, was, I think later on when you, you was up in the playoffs I'm listening I'm driving somewhere I'm listening to the game on the on the, um, on the radio as I'm driving because I'm still a South End supporter you understand and my my mates are playing at the I think the Millennium Stadium and I'm I'm still tuned in because I want the club to do well and whatever and then with they win the game I'm cheering in my car and find you know it's it's still there you know all my all my, my guys obviously like I say Jay and Tess were still around Leon Courty I think I can't remember if he kicked on them when I went to Hull but um but yeah my boys you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Well, looking forward to the uh, to our season. I mean, it's been a difficult time at Southend, hasn't it, with Ron and the takeover, the consortium, and uh, but yeah, how, what, what are your thoughts on Southend moving forward? Do you know what? I've, I'm, I've not been. I've only heard snippets of things that have been going on. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound good behind the scenes or whatever. But you know, all I like same as same as us all. I kind of hope things can get sorted out and we're. In a in a good place in the next few years. Um, I, what, I came to the game the other day. Kev's in charge now, and like you know, you play some good football. We play some good football. Just couldn't. If this is this is again me just sitting and watching sort of thing. The team played how I expect Kev's team to play, keeping the ball sort of thing. It's just at the other end, there's not there weren't enough chances being taken in terms of like shooting from outside there's opportunities to shoot from the edge of the area I would have loved to have seen a few more um, people taking a few pot shots sort of thing just to put things because as a striker I'm I've, um, I'm seeing I want my midfield to take either play me in or have a shot because if they shoot keep parrying it it's a tapping for me I'm following in and there was opportunities for that but they weren't doing them to get that going because I, the, the, mm. the new lad who came on at the end, I can't remember his name, his new signing. Um, oh, Waldron. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Danny he looked, Waldron. He looked lively. And I'm, I have no doubt, because I pulled him, I saw him in the car park after him, I had a word with him. I said, look, I told him exactly the same thing. He goes, you need to get onto your, your midfielders and get them shooting. Get them shooting, get them shooting, play you in or shooting, and just follow in. They're tappings all day. And that could, one of those, in that game there, because I think Southampton were on top for most of it, and then they got hit with a, mm. with a blow with a goal. But one of those chances, bang, 1-0 up. It would have been 2-0 up. And I'll tell you this as well. South End, a, a one team, when I played and also played against it, in they've got this thing. They're, the team have this thing, with the especially at Roots Hall, where, well, definitely at Roots Hall, where maybe the last 20 minutes of a game, half an hour, 20 minutes of a game, the team just go on the attack and it's relentless. And as as yeah. I've been in it, I've been in it and I'm playing it and I'm like, we anyone. That's where like you said there's been them ding dong ones, we've come back from 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 things from results sort of thing. It's this last twenty minutes and the supporters are all in it's like in this everyone's on you and it's supporting you and it's just this wave of attacks. You you the teams would clear the ball against us, then we win it back. Pocket wide, cross the ball in, we get cleared, we'd score or whatever. It's just this relentless um, attack. But playing against it, like when I when we won it, um, when I came there for Oxford and we won, but we had we've backed against the wall for the last twenty minutes, and it's this thing you just can't get out, can't get out, can't get out, and it's 
definitely like the supporters on on you and it's this energy, this weird energy, this burst of energy that the team has and the supporters give. I don't know if anybody else has noticed it or explained it to you, but it's just and I've not seen it that often with the places where I played, but it's definitely root tour to have this wave and it's always the last twenty minutes and even the game the other day where they lost, but the last fifteen minutes of the game, it was wave after wave after wave. And we needed one of them chances to break and it, it probably would have won the game. It's just a weird thing. So you don't know, yeah. need to hold on to that as a, as a club, as a supporter. Yeah, that's you know? it. The magic of the hall. 100% is there. Like, don't yeah. let anybody take it off, it's there. That's it. Well, now we're not leaving Roots Hall at all, which is good because there was talk of us going. Obviously, Ron wanted to build his stadium over Fossett's farm, but I love Roots Hall. I think we all love Roots Hall. It's a, it's a special ground. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have better games to come, screaming up the league. My prediction is we're going to win the title next season. That's what I've been saying. <laughs> I wouldn't even bet against it because again, it's one of them ones where where we are. Where, like what from what I saw, what it takes is a little bit, little bit of firming up, and then just somewhat. Because again, who did you have? Um, Freddie Eastwood. Years gone by, where yeah. you struggled. Then you got the like of him coming in, and him just taking it and just gold, 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 and then flying up the league and whatever. You need something like that. And it might be that Mr. Waldron, it might be him. It might be someone like that who just kind of starts netting and then you it's, and then just seal it, seal it up at the back and you're good to go. Hard to beat and scores goals. That's what you need. Can happen. Def- I can see it. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely, 100%. And, uh, and this league is so tight as well. I mean, when you look who's going up and who could come down, I don't think there's going to be much change to the league. And, you know, you put three or four wins together and you're right up there. But then again, you lose three or four and you're right down the other end, aren't you? So, yeah, you just need that one little guy, that one uh, like talisman, someone like Neeswood. Could be Waldron as well. He looks really sharp. So, yeah, fingers crossed. Oh, yeah, Constant, Leon, Leon Constantine as well. He, he did really well for you guys as well. Leon, yes. Leon Constantine. We'll have to try and get him on. Yeah, he was, he was fantastic. See, he, I never played with him, but... I played against him when he because when I was there he was he was at Orient when I was at South End and he always did well against us for Orient. But over the years we kind of got speaking and like we're good good mates now. Like on um, we speak over on online and we meet up certain times. But he's a good guy, man. Uh, Leon, he's a good guy. Scored some great goals as well for us as well. Yeah, not bad at all. Not bad at all. But uh, well. Time's against us, Mark. Um, we're gonna. Well, thanks for coming on today and having a good chat with us. All things South End United. It's been um, a pleasure chatting with you. We'll have to. Uh, we'll get you on again. Fantastic. Cheers, Mark. All the best. Cheers, mate. Massive thanks there to Mark Rawl uh, for coming on the show, and big thanks to you, Paul, for sorting it out. No, no worries. Again, thanks, Mark. It was a uh, what a chat that was. I mean, really in depth and insightful from a you know a great player I thought for uh, for us back in the uh, early 2000s and uh, what really got me was the Steve Wignall part because you, like we say we never know what goes on between players and managers and then you know Steve throws his toys out the pram saying he's gone above his head and all of this stuff but uh, you know Mark didn't want to leave he was a great player top scorer and you know everyone else getting contracts around him bringing in Drew Broughton and you know people do as a player you do face these challenges in there but you know, to let Mark go in that way, I thought was, you know, pretty poor form. Well, great for our listeners to be able to hear that. You know, we're pulling that curtain back, aren't we? It's Just kind a of bit. Showing people the, the backstage, behind closed doors stuff and, where you know, where the egos and the personalities and all those yeah. all those clashes happen. So great stuff and, and big thanks for that. Uh, we'll be back shortly. We're just going to take a little break, but we'll be back in a moment with Paul's previews. Bosh. Now it's time for everyone's favourite part of the show... Paul's previews. Paul, two home games. Yes. Two tricky games. Yes. Starting out on Saturday at Roots Hall against Aldershot. Yeah. What are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking, considering the last two results, we're building momentum now. Confidence should be picking up quite a bit and we should go and attack these two games. Because when you look at our last five, including the two results we just had, we've now won one, drew one, lost three. We've got them two goals. 
Hooray. But we've only conceded six, so we're not conceding too badly. Our home form really needs to pick up and improve. Because in our last five, we've only won one. We've drawn nil, lost the four, scoring four, conceding six. So now is the time to turn that around. And when we look at all the shot, I mean, you know, they're up there for a reason. You know, they have got a, a bit of a forward who can bang in goals, but I'll tell you a bit about him later. But their last five, they've won three, drawn one, lost the one, scoring eight, conceding nine. But their away form is really interesting. They've only won two. They've lost, drew one, sorry, lost two, scoring 11, conceding 12. And yeah, their away form isn't great. Pretty evens though on the goals conceded. So they yeah, can, so they yeah. do ship them, they do score them. If we can keep them quiet, which I think we can do, there's no reason why we can't. And now we've got a bit like Waldron and Crowther. Um, Harry now needs a goal. Wouldn't surprise me if Sandat pops one with a cheeky one. The midfield seems to be shooting a lot more now. So, you know, there are goals coming for us, I feel. So this could be a really good game for us to really turn this around, uh, our home form around. So who's their, uh, who's their danger man? Laurent Tolage with 15. OK. So he, he knows where the goal is and they do have an extra shrimper there as well. I mean, I think we mentioned him last time when we covered all the shot. Mr. Stuart O'Keefe, the journeyman. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not really worried about all the shots, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're picking it up now. We're buzzing from the Maidenhead victory. I think we've got to take that in to the all shot game. And, uh, yeah, hit the ground running. Let's go. Well, it's, it's kind of high pressure now, isn't it? it? Like we were saying earlier, the table's so tight. A little slip here and a, or a win there just makes such a massive difference. So um, high pressure and uh, they'll be going into all the shot, hoping to get the three points. And then immediately after on Tuesday, back to that sort of National League uh, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday swing, um, we have Altrincham come into Roots Hall. So another home game against another team that are significantly higher in the table than South End. it's fair to say at the minute, mm-hmm. sort of more mid-table. Um how are you feeling about welcoming Altrincham? Yeah, can't wait. Can't <laughs> wait. Bring them down. Bring them down. I think this is the game that was postponed, wasn't it? So I think they got about halfway here and then got told to go back home. Right. So yeah. they're, they're going to be coming down wanting to give it a good game. But their away form is even worse. So I'm looking forward to this one. But uh, in their last five, they've won two, drawn nil, lost three, scoring 10, conceding six. But listen to this for travels on the road. They've only won one, drawn yeah. one, lost the three, only scoring four. But they've only conceded seven, so not not too many. So they probably park the bus when they go away. I think it's going to be one of those ones, yeah, Yeah. where they're going to come here, stick every man and his dog behind the ball and try and catch us on the break. But uh, like I just said, I mean, if we can get a result against Hawtringham, take that in, uh, sorry, uh, Aldershot, take that on into Altrincham. I can't see any reason why, again, we can't be picking up points from these two games. Yeah, And, uh, well, they do have... A bit of a danger man as well. Yeah, who's that? Chris Con Clark. Okay. 17. I know. Yeah. Prolific. Prolific, yeah. But we've got Danny Waldron. Yes. Do you know what I mean? So, and Danny's going to score probably just as, if not more, He's going to go on a run. During his, per season during his time for his yeah. South End, I'm sure. And, uh, of course, our ex-man Dan Mooney is there. So he's going to be coming back to the hall, obviously, with a you know bit between his teeth, maybe something to prove. Uh, and we know, you know, he has got flashes of quality. So, you know, there's a couple of issues there. But again, no reason why we can't, uh, you know, deal with all of that. Uh, we need to be positive going into these two games. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot going on around us. Obviously, it's so tight, isn't it? Yeah. So we just need all guns firing. And uh, yeah, we're going to be all right. Well, it's, it's that situation where six points would be absolutely massive on the positive And, yeah. you know, zero points from these games would be... Oh, we'll be back down there again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Catastrophe. Mm. So again, you know, high pressure. Uh, so let's hope uh, next week we're having a, another positive chat. Yeah. And we've got, got some decent results. So uh, massive thank you to all of you out there listening to today's episode Uh, big thanks to you as well Paul always a pleasure never a chore sir and uh, thanks to Pip aka Diversity with a one top man and also Mark Rule for being our guest this week legend and uh, all that's left to say is make sure you're subscribed following and sharing the podcast with your South End supporting mates we shall see you next week and that's it for now Up the Blues Up the Blues Up the Blues